In this section, we're going to talk about the atom. <clears throat> Your book talks about some of these um, scientists that, that are on this page here, and I, I've added a few to kind of complete our picture of it. But basically, this uh, next lecture is going to be pretty much a, a history lesson in how the atom, the concept of the atom, was developed. Uh, I find it incredibly fascinating, especially when you consider they did all of this before, you know, any type of modern technology, any type of computers. Um, so these scientists really went out on a limb when they proposed their different types of models of the atom. So uh, they should be commended for that and remembered very, very highly for what they've accomplished. So our original definition of the atom okay, dates way back to the 5th century BC with uh, Democritus, not quite sure how to say that, um, but basically it was, you know, back in time when they did thought experiments. They didn't have uh, science, they didn't have experimentation, so they just basically thought of all matter as small indivisible particles, and they called those atomos. Uh, one thing to note, just want to point out uh, that this is indivisible, okay, meaning that it cannot be divided, not invisible, cannot be seen. Okay, so indivisible meaning they cannot be divided. They are as small as they can be. Our next definition of the atom comes with John Dalton. Okay, so roughly around the time that uh, Mendeleev is working on his periodic table just before that, John Dalton is also working at the same time on this concept of the atom. Okay. Very intelligent man. Uh, he fathered basically the first atomic theory that was based on empirical evidence that was based on experimentation and observation, so following the scientific method. Uh, he has a number of different uh, what he calls postulates, um, so basically looking at uh, different rules of, of how to describe an atom. And the first one, he says, all elements are made of tiny indivisible particles called atoms. Okay, so he's stemming from the original definition, not, not changing that necessarily. Um, and the way that they thought about this was um, basically it, it, all the atoms were kind of solid spheres. Okay? Um, and because of that, they call his uh, atomic theory, his concept of the atom, the billiard ball model. So each of our atoms are like billiard balls. That's how they were thinking of that. Uh, now, today, we know that this actually ends up being false. Okay. We do have smaller particles than just atoms, and we'll get to those uh, as we go through our history, but most of you probably know them. We have uh, protons. We have electrons and items like that, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, Dalton's first atomic theory ended up being false, but still, we, ha we have three more postulates. It was a big step um, to have this empirical evidence, so we'll keep going here. Uh, the second postulate, all atoms of the same element are identical and have the same mass. Atoms of different elements are fundamentally different. Okay. Um, so basically, one sphere is, if, if that sphere is hydrogen, if we find another sphere of hydrogen, those two spheres are identical. Okay. Um, we'll find out also later in this chapter that this is false, that even though elements are, or atoms of the same element look like they should be the same. Uh, they're not identical, and they actually are not going to have the same mass, and we call those isotopes. And we'll get to those um, again later in this chapter. The third postulate says that a chemical compound formed 
that they are formed when atoms combine with each other. A given compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. This is still true. And this is our general concept. Um, basically what he's saying is that uh, our chemical compounds are basically what happens when we get a bunch of spheres and we connect them together somehow. Okay, he's not saying how, um, he's just saying basically we put those spheres together. Now if we have the same ratio of spheres in the same order, then that is always the same chemical compound. And that uh, stems or goes back to our definition of what a pure substance is. Remember that fixed ratio for our pure substance versus a varying ratio for our mixtures. And so that postulate is still true. The fourth postulate says chemical reactions involve reorganizations of the atoms and changes in the way they are bound together. This is also still true. And to do a chemical reaction, basically what we're doing is we're taking a compound, so a collection of spheres. We're going to break those apart and rearrange the spheres and put them back together again. And if you're putting them back together again in a different orientation and a different arrangement or different ratios, you have chemically changed what you started with, so you have a chemical reaction. So for Dalton's postulate, uh, his atomic theory, um, he has the, the last two are still true, but the first two um, are false. And that was basically the development from uh, the knowledge that protons and electrons and neutrons do exist. So that brings us to our next scientist after John Dalton. We have J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson, I'm basically going to give you kind of a brief overview of this history. Um, he is known for the discovery of electrons, which we I shorthand with a symbol of a lowercase e and then a superscript of a negative sign. And that's because he also determined that uh, electrons are negatively charged. For his experiment, how he determined the uh, existence of electrons and that they're negatively charged, uh, he used what's called a cathode ray tube, also a CRT, might have heard that um, anagram that those letters used with computer screens, the, the old school ones, not the flat screen ones and the ones that are gigantic. Those were cathode ray tubes, CRT displays. And basically he had um, rays that would go through, he'd have a magnet around them, and those rays, he could bend them, which meant that there had to be some sort of attraction or unattraction. So that's where he came up with this concept of electrons. Okay. Um, his model of the atom, Kind of interesting to look at. Um, basically he said there's there's this kind of space, this schmear of positive charge. And he knew that there had to be positive charge because if we have something that's negatively charged we need something to balance it out. Um, and he said uh, you know in this schmear of positive charge there we have our electrons. And he said, basically these are masses in here. Okay. This is our electrons. Okay. They have mass. <clears throat> he also said in this positive charge, this positive charge was massless. Had no mass to it. Uh, the nickname for this is technically it's the plum pudding model. I believe plum pudding is uh, a British dessert. Not quite sure on that. Don't quote me. Um, but I like to think of this as the jello salad model. <laughs> 
Okay. So our positive charge that's massless, um, I call this the jello. Okay. Jello is very light and fluffy. Uh, the electrons are the, the grapes or the fruit that are put in jello salad. So that's kind of how I think of it. Now, um, J.J. Thompson, so that's his model of the atom, the discovery of the electrons. Uh, R.A. Millikan, he is, uh, his discovery was basically the mass of the electron. Okay, since uh, J.J. Thompson did say that electrons have mass, Millikan was able to determine what that mass was, and he did that via what's called the oil drop experiment. And kind of in a nutshell, what he was able to do is get um, atomically sized drops of oil, or very close to that size, and those drops of oil would fall, and he would make them charged, and he would adjust basically kind of a magnet around those oil drops and see what voltage it took to stop that oil drop from falling. And that was how he was able to get that mass of the electron. And yes, that's a very, very um, glossed over look of the experiment. The experiment's not what isn't what is important to us. We're just kind of looking at how our history has developed. So through J.J. Thompson and Millikan, uh, they're able to determine, yes, we have electrons that are negatively charged, and we have the mass of the electrons. Okay. So in steps uh, Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, and he started looking at um, basically, okay, if we have these, this model here, um, he did experiments where he shot alpha particles, which are really, really small, um, small nuclei basically, and he shot those kind of at a piece of gold foil. Okay. Um, the specific specifics aren't important again, we're just kind of looking at the history. Um, but what happened was when he shot these particles at the gold foil, um, most of them went straight through, okay, which is pretty much, you know, expected. We have this jello here that they're shooting through. But what was surprising was he would get some of those particles bouncing back at him. Okay. And the, the way that they, he was forced to kind of explain it to um, basically in layman's turn and in terms in people who were not scientific uh, is this is the equivalent of shooting a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and having that cannonball bounce back at you. Now, remember, they are just de determining that we have smaller particles than atoms. So to kind of wrap your mind around how they were able to even explain these phenomena that, they're, uh, that they were observing is just amazing. Okay. So what Rutherford then determines from this experiment is he basically discovers that we have something called the proton. We shorthand that a lowercase p with a uh, sub superscript is of a positive. Okay. And he actually says, and he proves with his experiment, that it's actually the proton that contains the mass. So protons... Um, Basically, they have a high or a large mass, okay. much, much more massive than the electrons. In fact, uh, Rutherford suggests that it is in the protons that you find the mass uh, of the atom. Okay. His experiment, uh, it's called the gold foil experiment. And his model of the atom is uh, nicknamed the planetary model. And for now, this is a the model that works for us. It's a fairly simplistic model of the atom, um, but it kind of gets all the points across and all the components of it, okay, of our atom.
Um, so our planetary model, so what he kind of suggests is uh, in the center, this is uh, our nucleus. And he says it contains uh, the protons. Now I'm kind of leaving it out, but there are other scientists that work on this. We now also know um, that it also contains neutrons. And they are neutrally charged, which is why it was very difficult for them to um, find them because generally things that are charged are easier to locate. So in the nucleus we have our protons and that's where we have all of the mass. And the mass of the atom is in that tiny little nucleus in the center. Then surrounding our nucleus, this is called our electron cloud. And basically that's where they say the electron can be found. It's nicknamed the planetary model because originally they thought uh, these electrons uh, were, were moving very fast and they moved in kind of a circular orbit, much like the Earth and the planets uh, orbit around the sun. So kind of in our scenario, the, the center nucleus would be our sun, the electrons would be uh, the uh, planets going around and around and around. We'll get later, um, later in this chapter, we'll actually discuss specifically where these electrons are located and, and how they move. So this isn't technically correct, but for now, this is a, a good enough start of where we want to be for discussing the atom. So basically we have three components of the atom. We have the protons, the nutrient, neutrons, which live in the nucleus and we have the electrons living in this electron cloud. Um, you're going to watch a video next about the size of an atom. Kind of a, it's a cool um, video with some really cool animations. Um, basically it's 1 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, which we give a special unit to. We call it an angstrom, and that's a capital A with a little uh, dot or degree symbol on top. We call this an angstrom. And the approximate mass of our protons and our neutrons, uh, the protons and neutrons are roughly the same mass and they have a mass of about 10 to the negative 24 grams. Okay, so fairly small. Uh, the mass of our electron is about 10 to the negative 28 grams. So technically still has mass, but in terms of measurable mass, really the protons and the neutrons are much more important for us. Uh, so we consider the mass of the electron to be negligible. So we're going to kind of basically ignore it from here on out.